today on Let the Bible Speak. Saying no can be one of the most difficult things to do in life. Today we meet four people who had the courage to say it and thus change the world. Let the Bible Speak starts right now. From the Churches of Christ, Let the Bible Speak with Kevin Presley. Hello, and thanks for joining me today for a study of the Word of God. I'm so glad you've chosen to be with us. Saying no may seem like an easy thing to do, but in reality, it's quite difficult. With the pressure of peers, employers, family members, friends, and of the world in general bears down upon us, well, we find it hard to refuse their requests or demands. Our lesson today will involve four brave and faithful men who mustered the courage to say no when their souls hung in the balance. They should inspire us to have the bravery and courage of our convictions to refuse the same things that would be offered to us today. Our lesson will be entitled, Royal Refusals. And these four great refusals represent the kind of self-denial required of anyone who would be faithful to Jesus Christ today. Do you have the courage to refuse? Stay with me for our study in a moment. Connect with us on social media. Go to Facebook.com and search for Let the Bible Speak TV. To a world steeped in darkness of sin and despair, the Lord God in mercy sent someone to care. We Saying no is usually not easy, especially if we must refuse one who is in authority or one who could decide our fate. Solomon said in Proverbs 20 and verse 2, the wrath of a king is like the roaring of a lion. Whoever provokes him to anger sins against his own life. Well, history is replete with stories of courageous people who stood up to dictators and despots, refusing to compromise their beliefs and their moral convictions, and they paid with their lives for doing so. But there are none who possessed more valor than the four people I want to talk to you about today. Their royal refusals are inspiring accounts of faith and determination that had God not been with them, they too would have paid the ultimate price. They serve as inspirational examples to those of every age who must learn to say no to the world and its allurements if they are to be loyal to the King of Kings. The first of all is the story of the royal adoption and the refusal of all of the privileges and powers that accompanied it. The scripture reads in Hebrews, the 11th chapter, verses 24 through 27, 
By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. This must have been a hard choice for Moses from a human vantage point, because for the first 40 years of his life, all he knew were the pleasures and treasures of the royal palace of Egypt. When he was only three months old, his mother had to give him up due to an order from the Pharaoh to kill the Hebrew children, lest the Hebrew slaves grow so numerous and powerful enough to mount an insurrection and go free. So in order to save his life, that godly and selfless mother, Jochebed, made that little floating cradle and placed her precious boy within it and set it afloat among the reeds in the Nile River. She had no idea what would come of him except that she was trusting God to take care of him and that he did. You remember it wasn't long until Pharaoh's daughter came down to the river to bathe and she and her servants saw that little ark floating along the river bank and when they fetched it out of the water and looked inside, they saw the baby Moses who began to cry. Well, the princess's heart was moved with love and compassion, and she decided that this child of Hebrew slaves would become her own, and she took him home and adopted him. Moses' older sister saw all that transpired that day and courageously approached the princess of Egypt and asked if she could get one of the Hebrew women to come and nurse the child. And when the princess agreed, she brought the child's own mother, Jochebed, to him to care for him for the first few years of his life. And Jochebed in those formative years planted seeds of faith in that little boy's heart that lay there for 40 years until one day when he was long since grown, he saw an Egyptian taskmaster beating a, a Hebrew slave and he was so enraged with righteous indignation that he rose up and slew the Egyptian and buried him in the sand. When the word was out, Moses' life was endangered and he spent the next 40 years in exile until God sent him back to lead the people out of bondage and take them to the promised land. Well, the scripture says that Moses made a choice when he killed the Egyptian, when he left the royal household, when he forsook the privileges afforded him in the palace of the great king. He from that day forward refused to be called Pharaoh's son. And the Bible says he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. His refusal to be called her son meant that he would forever endure the scorn of the people who had rescued him from the Nile and raised and fed and clothed and educated him. It meant the sacrifice of wealth, power, influence, and all of the pomp and glory that went along with being a prince in Egypt. But Moses made a wide cho wise choice. For today he is forgotten in the annals of Egyptian history. He is not a name honored among the pharaohs of the past, but his name is recorded in faith's hall of fame. And here we are 3,500 years later speaking of the faith and the fidelity of this great man and his courage. He became the leader and savior of Israel in that time and the one who typified the Christ who eventually would come and free us all from the bondage of sin. Well, would to God that more people had the wisdom and the fortitude to make such a choice, to see that the treasures of this world fade, but the riches of Christ are eternal. The Apostle Paul said in Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above. The King James says, set your affection on things above and not on things of the earth. John said, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15-17. And the Christian has severed his ties to earth and its wickedness, as Paul said in Galatians 4 and verse 5, that we may receive the adoption of sons. Somewhere in Moses' heart, he remembered that he was not an Egyptian. He was a Hebrew, and thus he belonged to God and the people of God. And he had the courage to forsake the many riches and privileges that otherwise could have been his in order to obtain heaven. 
Do you have the faith and the courage to make this kind of royal refusal? Well, number two, there is the refusal of the royal armor by the young man David. And there's an important lesson in this for us as well. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, Israel is at war with the Philistines. And day after day, a champion of the Philistines taunted the people of God, challenging them to send forth a man to meet him. Goliath, nearly 10 feet tall, was formidable, and he defied the armies of Israel. Well, King Saul was dismayed, and he was afraid. But David, then but a ruddy youth, he sized up the giant and volunteered to fight Goliath, saying, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? He said, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Well, people thought David had lost his mind, and even Saul doubted his ability to meet this giant foe. So the Bible says in 1 Samuel 17, beginning in verse 38, So Saul clothed David with his armor, and he put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. And with just his staff, a sling, and five smooth stones from the brook, you perhaps well remember the story, David stepped out to meet the great giant. Well, not to even speak of meeting such a large and formidable foe, it must have taken great courage for David to say no to the king, to his own king, and to refuse the armor of Saul. It must have been shocking to see David take off those protective armaments and step out with his shepherd's bag full of rocks to meet Goliath. It was certainly a courageous thing itself to refuse Saul's armor and go his own way, but yet the true and faithful Christian refuses the world's armor as well. In the battle for truth and right, the armor of the world is unproven and it's insufficient. You remember Christians in the ancient Roman Empire were ridiculed, rejected, and even tormented for refusing the pagan Rome and its emperor worship. They were even persecuted because they refused the trappings of that evil system with its paganism and emperor worship. John, as he recorded the revelation, would say of them, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. But yet those bold and faithful disciples refused and they paid the price of ridicule, scorn, and many of them, even their lives. The world wonders why the church rejects its ways today, its ways of thinking, its ways of religion, its ways of worship. Even the religious world looks in disdain as the faithful few reject the doctrines and traditions of men to only practice what is authorized in the Bible. It seems when everyone else accepts change and unscriptural innovations in the work and worship of the church, the faithful refuse. The religious world says it can't be done without the use of those things that men have invented to serve God with. But the true people of God refuse to use what cannot be proven by the Word of God. And it doesn't matter how many go along with error or how small and seemingly insignificant the number of those who refuse may be. If it is not authorized in the Word of God, we dare not accept it and we dare not take it into the battle. And again, may God give you and me the courage to go against the tide of popular opinion and refuse the armor of men, and rather take up the armor of God. And then there is the royal refusal of the king's food and his wine. Daniel is another young man of spiritual strength and resolve who teaches us an important lesson in saying no. When he was 16 years old, Daniel was taken off into Babylonian captivity. He was chosen for service to the king and became God's mouthpiece to the Gentile captors and his fellow Jewish captives. He, along with several others, were placed under the master of the eunuchs for training for this king's service. These were gifted and talented young men who found favor with the king, and the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank and appointed them to a certain amount of time for training when they would then be presented to the king for service. We're told, though, in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, that Daniel purposed in his heart 
that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. And therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. You see, Daniel was fully aware that the Jewish dietary laws would not be honored by the king of Babylon, and he knew that the meat he was given was from idolatrous sacrifices, and therefore because of his deep convictions, he refused to eat. He would rather offend the king of Babylon than offend the God of heaven. When time showed that Daniel was faring better than even they were without the king's meat and drink, well, the king seemed to respect Daniel's convictions and his consistent keeping of his religion because the king promoted him. You know, sometimes the world will try to put a Christian at odds with his faith. If you're living for the Lord, uh, there'll be times when uh, you will be put to the test. The world will test your convictions to see just how genuine and how deep they are. The world will try to get you to compromise what you believe, and severe consequences can even be threatened for not giving in. A corporation or a business may ask you to lie or be deceitful in order to protect its interests, and not doing so could mean not getting that promotion or even worse, losing your job. Or a boss may demand that you work on Sunday mornings, meaning you can't keep your appointment with the Lord to worship with the local congregation. Now, many today have sold out, and they don't think that's a very big deal. Not many businesses and companies respect the Lord's Day anymore, but Christians are to respect the Lord's Day. It's a special day. And we're told not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, as some in the early church had begun to make a habit of doing, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. Well, today, if you hold that conviction as well you should, if you're a follower of Jesus, uh, more than likely that's going to be put to the test at some point. So what are you to do? Or perhaps that same business, or perhaps a, your family, maybe friends, they place you in a compromising position and they want you to go somewhere and be part of something that a Christian really has no business being a part of. What will you do? Do you have the courage of Daniel to say no? Many people never even try to say no. They compromise because they're afraid of what may happen if they refuse. But if you have honest convictions and you stay sincerely true to those convictions, such faith and fidelity will likely garner much more respect than compromising and giving in whenever opposition presents itself. You're saying to people all around you when you compromise that your religion really doesn't mean much, that your convictions don't run very deep. Your resolve to follow Christ isn't all that real. Resolve to be like Daniel. Resolve to put Christ and His will first in your life, and you won't be sorry. This is yet another royal refusal that we must have the courage to commit ourselves to. And then finally, there is the royal refusal of earthly power. In John chapter 6, Jesus performed a great miracle that made Him very popular with the people. Uh, he miraculously fed thousands of people and when they saw this, it reminded them of Moses and how the people following Moses so long before were given manna to eat in the wilderness. And so you might say they started a grassroots movement that day to take Jesus and install Him as their king to free them from Roman rule and lead them to worldly greatness, which they very much aspired to. Now that may on the surface sound good, but the problem is that wasn't God's plan. Jesus knew the kingdom that His Father had waiting for Him was not of this world. John chapter 18 and verse 36, and that's a lesson that many so-called Christians need to learn yet today. But the record tells us in John chapter 6 and verse 15 that Jesus therefore perceiving that they were about to come and take Him by force to make Him a king, withdrew again into the mountain Himself alone. Jesus was refusing the kingship that they were offering Him. This refusal is remarkable because Jesus had come into this world specifically for the purpose of becoming our king. But the Jews misunderstood the nature of His kingdom, just like many do yet today. And what they wanted to do was exactly what the devil had proposed to Jesus when He tempted Him in the wilderness, promising to give Him all the kingdoms of this world if Jesus would bow down and worship Him. You see, the people then were offering Jesus a crown, but it wasn't the kind that He would wear. A crown of gold bedecked with jewels, you see, never commands the kind of love, loyalty, and devotion that the King of Kings desires. He instead chose to wear a crown of thorns, marked with the blood He would shed for our redemption. 
And like Jesus, we too must be willing to say no to this world's crowns. Like the woman who many years ago refused to be crowned Miss America because the costume she would have to wear was immodest and indecent, and she refused to wear it. Well, that cost her greatly. The glittering crowns you and I might turn down might consist of fame or wealth or popularity or power, but we should be willing to refuse them to follow Jesus. He refused them, and so should we. Jesus went to a cross in the ultimate of self-denial, and He calls upon us to do the same thing if we would follow Him. Following Jesus requires that kind of courage, that kind of conviction, that kind of refusal. These four royal refusals remind us of what it means to take up our crosses and follow Christ. This world's adoption, its armor, its delicacies, or its crowns should never turn us away from the pledge that we make to Christ when we obey the gospel or from the heavenly goal that is set before us. Because I want you to listen to me today, there is nothing, nothing, nothing in this passing world that is worth forfeiting the fellowship and favor of God and the joys of heaven for. And may we all have the courage to say no as these courageous souls did so long ago. What an awful price was paid when Jesus died upon that tree shed His precious blood for sinners you and me. We have not to pay, but Jesus freely ransomed our Subscribe to our YouTube channel to see all of our past broadcasts plus extra videos including Let the Bible Speak classics all the way back to the 1960s. And get new updates, go to YouTube and search for Let the Bible Speak TV and click on subscribe. As always, it's been a delight to be with you today and I'm really thankful that you've taken the time to open up the Word of God and study with me for this period of time. I hope our lesson today has challenged you and inspired you to be faithful to your convictions if indeed your convictions are founded upon the Word of God. And if you've never taken your stand for the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've never turned your back upon this world 
and pledged your allegiance unto the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, I hope you'll do that this very day. It can be a difficult decision. It will require much of you. It will require self-denial, taking up your cross, and following Jesus, oftentimes at great, great personal cost. But it's worth it. As we learned of Moses today, it's better to suffer affliction with the people of God and to reap the great reward in the by and by than to enjoy the fleeting and fickle pleasures of this world and of sin, but for a season. If we can assist you in your obedience to the gospel, in being baptized into Christ, in making that great decision today, we hope you'll let us know, and we'd love to do just that. If you'd like a copy of our lesson, a free printed transcript, we'll be happy to send it to you. Get in touch with us and request the lesson, Royal Refusals, and it'll be on its way. Uh, be sure to join us again next Lord's Day for another study from the Word of God. Tell someone else about our program. Look us up on the internet. Follow us on social media and share our page with others around you, your friends and family, and encourage them to discover the truth of New Testament Christianity as well. I hope you have a wonderful week ahead, and you'll plan to join me back here next time. Until then, I pray the Lord will richly bless you. Bible Speak is brought to you by your friends in the Churches of Christ.